Chapter 9 For Griffin, watching a plan coming together was like completing a jigsaw puzzle. It started as a flimsy frame on the outer edges, then slowly the pieces filled in until the final image began to appear. With the baseball card heist, however, the finished picture was mar marred by a gaping black hole named Luther. It was Savannah's fourth meeting with the Doberman, and the girl was still baffled. I don't understand it, she confessed, leaning against the fence outside Palomino's Emporium. I fed him, soothed him, talked to him, reasoned with him. I watched the horse whisper twice last night, hoping for inspiration. Maybe you should watch Dog Whisper Her, Ben suggested glumly. I've already TiVoed the entire season, she replied earnestly. Nothing helps. I never thought I could write off an innocent animal. But I have to admit it, this dog is beyond my reach. Griffin was stricken. You're giving up? No, you can't. She shrugged helplessly. Believe me, it doesn't make me happy. But what choice do I have? She indicated Luther on the other side of the fence. Look at his eyes. There's no let up in the anger. Not even any curiosity about me. This is my fourth night here, but to him, I'm just an intruder. Griffin was devastated. You can't quit now, he moaned. Please, please give it one more shot. Savannah's look of disappointment morphed into deep suspicion. Wait a minute. I know you guys. You're not getting this worked up over a dog. What's this really about? Griffin hesitated. The more people who were in on a conspiracy, the greater the chance that one of them would let something slip. But he had no choice. Without a dog whisperer to neutralize Luther, any plan would be doomed. There was no way to sugarcoat it. So he told her straight out. We need you to calm down the dog so we can break into the store and steal a baseball card. Savannah's jaw dropped open in shock, so Griffin quickly stammered. It's, it's not as bad as it sounds. We'll give you a cut of the money. Her face burned bright red with fury. I can't believe you just said that. You want me to help you pull off a robbery? You're either crazy or you think I'm crazy. I'm telling my mother. I'm telling Mr. Palomino. I'm telling the police. As her voice rose, she gestured wildly, and a couple of fingers penetrated the chain-link friends. Like a shark smelling blood in the water, Luther snapped at her hand and would have taken off both digits if Ben hadn't pulled her back from the gate. Her rage doubled. Savannah wheeled on the Doberman. You miserable, mangy waste of dog food! How dare you do that to me! I've shown you nothing but kindness, and this is how you behave? You don't deserve to be an animal. Rabies would be too good for you. You should be put on a rocket ship and blasted to Alpha Centauri, you evil, soulless, ill-tempered, psychopathic canine. Griffin and Ben were frozen in shock at the sudden change in their classmate. Never had they heard such a tirade, and certainly not from soft-spoken, level-headed Savannah Drysdale. But the boy's reaction was mild compared to the effect of the outburst on Luther. The lunging beast tumbled off the fence as if it had suddenly become boneless. It dropped to its belly and began groveling towards Savannah, wagging its tail and whimpering, gazing up at her with soulful, pleading eyes. Savannah, breathed Ben. Look, I'm never going to forgive you guys for this, she hissed. Do you think I wanted to take a proud, glorious animal and break his spirit? It's okay, Griffin insisted. This is exactly what we were hoping for. Now you see where crime gets you, she seethed. Not only are both of you going to jail, but you forced me to go against everything I've ever believed in. I've destroyed this beautiful dog. This beautiful dog almost ate two of your fingers, Ben reminded her. Savannah, listen, Griffin said. We're not criminals. That card is rightly ours. I don't care, Savannah interrupted hotly. I'm leaving. She reached through the fence and stroked the dark fur behind Luther's neck. I'm sorry, boy. I didn't mean to do it. The Doberman rolled over, presenting its belly to be tickled. Griffin was desperate. Fine. You can leave. You can even hate our guts, but please don't tell anybody that what we're, what we're planning. 
<laughs> no fear of that. Savannah was clearly both angry and hurt. As far as I'm concerned, you two nut jobs don't even exist anymore. If you want my opinion, you should both seek mental help. She kissed Luther through the fence, promised, I'll come see you, visit you, sweetie, and stormed off into the night. Griffin watched her walk away. Well, he said that could have been a lot worse. Ben gawked at him. I hope you're kidding. Think about it. She took care of the dog and promised not to rot us out. What more could we ask for? Luther tossed them a baleful look and trotted off into the shadows near the store. Ben was unconvinced. I don't know, Griffin. He doesn't look so taken care of to me. What if the dog whispering only works for Savannah? Griffin shrugged. You saw how to handle him. If he gets uppity, you just have to yell and scream and threaten to send him to Alpha Sindori. I've got that special feeling in my gut, and it says the time is to act is now. Ben frowned. Griffin's gut was as reliable as Old Faithful when it came to choosing the right time to put a plan into action. Only, we're not ready yet, he protested. The plan isn't even finished. We still don't have a way to get past the dead bolts and into the store. Oh, yes, we do. The man with the plan could not suppress a smile. Remember that fifth grade project on the Trojan War? Chapter 10 On October 10th, at exactly 5.30 p.m., S. Dutt Wendell Palomino left his store and drove off into his, in his Honda Element. He never noticed two furtive eyes peering out of a narrow alleyway at the end of the block. A moment later, Griffin teetered onto the sidewalk, struggling with a heavily laden hand truck. Balanced on the cargo ledge was a large crate that might have held a 33-inch TV. It did not hold a 33-inch TV. There was a grunt of pain as the hand truck bounced over a spot of broken pavement and a voice from inside the box hissed, Watch it! Griffin said nothing. In the Trojan War, talking to the warriors hidden inside the wooden horse was a definite no-no. Twisting his neck to see over his shoulder, he backed down the street and peeked in the open gate in front of Palomino's Emporium. Perfect. No customers. Tom Dufferin was alone, tidying up the sales counter. Griffin frowned. The assistant manager had a clear view of the door. Come on, he thought. Move. A minute passed, then two. Sweat formed on Griffin's brow. How long could he stand here before someone noticed a thousand-pound crate in the care of an 11-year-old delivery man? At last, Dufferin picked up an armload of comics and headed to a display case at the back of the shop. Now! Griffin nearly dislocated both shoulders, tipping the load so he could roll it in again. Ears roaring, he hauled the shipment in through the gate and set it down at the entrance. Uh-oh! The hand truck was stuck under the weight of the container. He couldn't budge it. What's going on? came an urgent whisper from the box. What's all that shaking? Shh! Griffin hissed. Inside the store, Dufferin had finished shelving the comics. In another few seconds, he'd be back at the front. Griffin marshaled his strength and gave a mammoth yank. With a screech, the cargo ledge pulled free. One of the metal handles whacked him in the mouth and he staggered backward, tasting blood. Really, he scampered out through the gate. It had been close, but he'd made the drop-off. The operation had begun. Tom Dufferin frowned at the bulky crate that had suddenly appeared at the door. He hadn't heard the delivery truck. It must have been come in the last few minutes when he'd been in the back. He examined the brown paper that covered the wooden frame. It bore the address of the shop and the message. Attention, S. Wendell Palomino, personal and confidential, to be opened by addressee only. With a shrug, Tom dragged a heavy container inside. Idly, he wondered what was so special that Palomino himself had to open it. Printed matter, probably, judging by the weight, somebody's lifelong collection of comic books or magazines. He set the store's alarm stepped out and locked the door behind him. Whatever it was, the boss would deal with it when he arrived the next morning. On the other side of the glass, the paper moved ever so slightly, the rustle of nervous breath through air holes. There were times that Ben Slavic wished he had an ordinary best friend instead of the man with the plan. An ordinary best friend never would have convinced him to shut himself in a TV crate to get inside Palomino's Emporium. 
That was definite. As Trojan horses went, the crate was a cramped affair. Ben was the smallest kid in the sixth grade. Still, he had to lie on his side with his knees pulled into his chest to fit into the small space. No pain, no gain, he reminded himself. This is for a million bucks. For some reason, the money didn't seem quite real to him. Helping the Bings, saving them from having to sell their house. That was real. He'd do anything not to lose Griffin. But a million dollars for a baseball card? Science fiction. Yet, the weight of all that cash closed in on him as relentlessly as the frame of the crate. Stealing something worth a million was the same as stealing the million itself, wasn't it? On top of everything else that made him uneasy about this caper, he couldn't escape the feeling that they might be committing a very serious crime. He peered through the gloom at his watch, 6.03. Sundown was supposed to come at 6.57. After that, the plan added 30 minutes more to let it get dark. By that time, it would be impossible to read the dial. Count, Griffin had instructed. Easy for him to say. 87 minutes equaled 5,220 seconds, and, hey, now it was 6.05. The first 120 seconds were already over. He could just start at 121, 122, 123. Just before 200, he was aware of the first yawn. Stop it, he commanded himself. Nobody falls asleep in the middle of a heist. Yet, as he counted doggedly on, he could feel his eyelids getting heavier, the way they always did. No, not here, not now. He had barely reached 500. 529? His, his voice filled the empty store. 530? This was crazy. Fear alone should be keeping him awake. Did Achilles get caught napping inside the Trojan horse? 801? 802. He actually counted 803, but he was no longer awake to hear it. Chapter 11. Here, Luther. Where are you, boy? Griffin squinted through the gate into the darkness of the yard. The Doberman was nowhere to be seen. Griffin frowned. Not that he had any great love for the dog, but it was always unnerving when real life didn't match what you planned for. What if Luther had been left overnight in the store? If Ben opened the crate to find that ravening beast staring at him, he'd have a heart attack. Anxiously, Griffin began to climb the fence. It was tougher than he expected because of the acetylene tank of his father's blowtorch. Acetylene tank of his father's blowtorch, which was strapped to his back. He clambered down the opposite side and shined a flashlight through the display window. No sign of Ben or the dog. Griffin's eyes fell on the crate, which just sat inside the door. The wrapping paper was undisturbed. He checked his watch. It was 7.45. Why was Ben still in the box? He rapped on the glass. Ben! His stage whisper into the crack of the door. He knocked harder. What are you doing, man? It's time! He had experienced a moment of irrational terror. Had they forgotten the air holes? And then the scissors broke through the brown paper. Griffin watched breathlessly as the blade sawed laboriously around the square frame and disappeared again. A moment later, the lid was pushed open and Ben's head popped into view. Griffin took in the bleary, blinking eyes. He fell asleep? Through his disbelief, Griffin couldn't suppress a hint of admiration. It was hard to imagine anyone being able to relax at a time like this. Ben was one in a million. A beeping sound brought Griffin back to urgent focus. The alarm. The intruder had triggered the motion sensor. Ben scrambled to the keyboard, keypad. He had 30 seconds, no more. Griffin tried to fight off his uncertainty as his friend punched in 1701. If they were wrong about the code, the siren was going to bust every eardrum between here and New York City. There was a triple chime and the beeping stopped. The alarm was off. Ben unlocked the door and let Griffin inside. Sorry I'm late, he said sheepishly. Any problems with the dog? Griffin shone his flashlight up and down the aisles. The dog's a no-show. Must be flea bath night. Ben looked around restively. restively. I hate this place. It's like the wiring of those cases is going to come alive and strangle us. Griffin paddled the blowtorch. Forget the cases. All we want is a safe. They followed the beam to the original scene of the crime. Swindle's sales desk. 
Griffin felt no guilt, only the exhilaration of a perfectly executed plan. They had done it. They were inside. No dog, fence, deadbolt, or burglar alarm could stop them now. He moved behind the counter and froze. The lockbox was not there. Where's the safe? he blurted. Ben appeared at his side. Behind the cash register, his mouth fell open. It was right here attached to the floor. Griffin got down on his knees and focused the flashlight on the weathered hardwood. Four bolt holes marked the spot where the lockbox had once been. Search the store, Griffin rasped. They combed the aisles, the stock area, even the bathroom. The safe was nowhere to be found. Griffin looked stunned. I considered every possible move and counter move except one. Ben nodded miserably. A safe can be bolted, can also be unbolted, and taken someplace else. Swindle had turned out to be a step ahead of them. A perfect plan, executed perfectly, and it's all for nothing. Maybe not, Ben said hopefully. I mean, the card's not here, but we're standing in the middle of Swindle's store, so instead, why don't we just take a bunch of other stuff that adds up to the same money? Griffin swelled like a blowfish. I am not a thief. I came here to find what's rightfully mine and take it back. I don't want anything that doesn't belong to me. But you'll never track down that card now, Ben reasoned. Who knows where Swindle could have hidden it. It could be in a safe deposit box in a bank vault. Griffin could only offer a helpless shrug. There was no quit in him, no surrender, but without the slightest clue where the Bambino might be now. No amount of planning, or creative thinking, or even genius was going to make a particle of difference. The man with the plan had run out of ideas. Chapter 12 Misery There was no, no other word for it. Watching Mrs. Brampton march in an endless parade of house hunters through the Bing home was more than Ben could hair, bear. He regarded each potential buyer with suspicion and outright hostility. Could this, these nice people be the enemy, the ones who would force Griffin's family to move, who would split up the greatest pair of friends Cedarville had ever seen? As awful as it was for Ben, it had to be even worse for Griffin. It was his life that was being turned upside down, and not just by real estate agents. His entire personality had changed. The fire was gone, along with the razor-sharp sense of purpose that had always guided him. How many times had Ben prayed for a break from Griffin's never-ending schemes? Now he would have given his right arm to hear his friend burst out with, All right, here's the plan. To do something, anything, whatever it was, it had to be better than treading water, waiting for the inevitable. An offer on the house, a deal, packing, moving, the end of Griffin and Ben. At least it wasn't boring. The Bings were looking for reasons to be out of their home while it was being shown, so they were dragging Griffin and Ben with him to every mall, park, carnival, street fair, and free concert. On the surface, he was having fun. But deep down, it was like trying to enjoy great food while suffering from a gut blast or stomach ache. It was hard to be entertained today when tomorrow seemed very little like entertainment. And anyway, all he could think about was yesterday. The unsuccessful heist haunted the boys. The cleanup, op cleanup operation replayed itself in an endless loop in Ben's head. Ditching the empty TV crate, locking and re-alarming the store, even wiping the fingerprints from the keypad and doorknobs had been a half-hearted effort. Who would call the police to investigate the disappearance of absolutely nothing? At the most, Tom Dufferin might wonder about the delivery that had mysteriously disappeared. More likely, he would assume that his boss had dealt with it. In a way, the operation had been the perfect crime, in and out without a trace. How could such a glorious success have been such a dismal failure? They hashed and rehashed the details until their throats went dry. Only the roles were reversed. Ben was the one prodding, what now? What next? You can't heist something if you don't know where it is, Griffin said sadly. And it made total sense. In every way but one, Griffin Bing did not admit defeat. It was simply not in his DNA. How had he suddenly became, become the man without the plan? They were riding home from yet another concert in the Bing's van when the barking sounded. Not the playful yelp of a house pet, but a full-throated braying. Goes to show how I've got swindle on the brain, Grim Griffin mumbled unhappily. For a minute there, I could have sworn I heard Luther. 
Ben peered out the rear window. A large black dog was chasing them. I don't think that's even a Doberman, as they left their pursuer yelling stubbornly in the road. A thoughtful expression appeared on Ben's face. Wait a minute. It, it wasn't Luther, but it could have been. Griffin regarded him oddly. It could have been my grandmother, too, and it wasn't. What are you talking about? Don't you get it? The real Luther has to be somewhere. He wasn't at the store on heist night. Where is he? Griffin gave a listless shrug. At home, I guess. Swindle probably gave him a few days off threatening people at Palomino's Emporium. It's no big deal. The card isn't even there anymore. Think, Ben ordered. What if Luther's absence and the card's absence are connected? Don't talk in riddles, man. Luther's a guard dog, Ben reasoned. When the Bambino was at the store, so was Luther. But if Swindle brought Luther home... Light dawned on Griffin. The card is at Swindle's house. When they reached the Bings, Griffin and Ben made a beeline for the phone book. Please let the guy live in town. Griffin threw the directory open to the P's. More specifically, Palomino S.W. There was the address. 531 Park Avenue Extension. That's not too far from the store, Ben exclaimed breathlessly. We did it, Griffin. We figured out where the card is. Griffin nodded, his cheeks flushed with purpose. Now all we need, Ben finished his sentence, is a plan, not just any plan, this time we need the ultimate plan.